Tonight at 10, Donald Trump signals a fundamental change in the way America will trade with the rest of the world. Great thing for the American worker, what we just did. The president opens his first full week in office by signing an order withdrawing the US from a major free trade deal with Pacific Rim countries. He meets business leaders at the White House and warns he will penalize American companies that move jobs overseas. A company that wants to fire all of its people in the United States and build some factory someplace else and then thinks that that product is going to just flow across the border into the United States, that's not going to happen. And the White House confirms that trade will be high on the agenda when Theresa May visits the White House later this week. Also tonight, following reports that a Trident missile test went wrong last year, the Prime Minister again refuses to confirm or deny what happened. I'm regularly briefed on national security issues. I was briefed on the successful certification of HMS Vengeance and her crew. We don't comment on the operational details for national security reasons. A series of failures led to a prisoner's suicide. His family say that the prison authorities had been warned. Doctors in Sheffield are pioneering the use of a small MRI brain scanner designed for use on premature babies. And Nicola Adams, the double Olympic boxing champion, talks to us about her decision to turn professional. In the south, warnings of further disruption caused by fog after a day of grounded flights, delayed ferries and dozens of accidents on our roads. And caught in the act, another crackdown on drivers who use their mobiles at the wheel. Good evening. President Trump has opened his first full week in office by signing an order formally withdrawing the US from a major free trade deal with Pacific Rim countries. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated by the Obama administration, but it was never ratified formally by Congress. The White House confirmed today that trade would be featuring prominently in the president's talks with Theresa May at the end of this week. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has sent this report. We've been talking about this for a long time. Thank you. Oh, the power of the pen. These are executive orders being signed by the president as he starts his first week in the job. From now on, America will have nothing more to do with the Pacific trade deal. Okay. Another order sets in train plans to renegotiate the NAFTA agreement with Mexico and Canada, a far more complex undertaking. And there's to be a freeze on recruitment to federal jobs. And one other executive order, particularly eye-catching, that was signed today is that aid agencies in receipt of US government funds will now no longer be able to offer abortions or advice on abortions in their fieldwork around the world. Now, this has been a political football going back for decades, with Democrats rescinding it, Republicans reimposing it, but it's an important indication of where Donald Trump stands on this issue and what may be the future social policy for America as well. Mark was so nice with the plan. Coming back, I wanted to sit next to him. I must be honest. <laughs> but this is the real focus. Forget the cheerful bonhomie. The president must deliver on the economy, and he intends to wield both a carrot and a stick. First the stick. A company that wants to fire all of its people in the United States and build some factory someplace else and then thinks that that product is going to just flow across the border into the United States, that's not going to happen. They're going to have a tax to pay, a border tax, a substantial border tax. And finally, the carrot. What we're doing is we are going to be cutting taxes massively for both the middle class and for companies, and that's massively. At his first full uh, press briefing, the focus of his spokesman was still on jobs and trade. Will there be a detailed discussion when uh, Prime Minister May comes on Friday on the potential parameters of what a trade deal might look like? Well, look, uh, we're here on working day one. We're excited that uh, Prime Minister May is coming on Friday. We look forward to it. I'm sure that there'll be a discussion of trade. 
uh, will come up to the, the degree to which I don't know yet. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to brief you out. I don't believe we have any plans right now for a joint press conference. But that's something that our team will be working out with Prime Minister May, and, and we'll keep you updated on that. But after a finger-wagging lecture delivered to the press at the weekend, when he may not have been entirely truthful himself, this question. Is it your intention to always tell the truth from that podium, and will you pledge never to knowingly say something that is not factual? It is. It's an honor to do this. And uh, yes, I believe that we have to be honest with the American people. I think sometimes we can disagree with the facts. The president a short time ago met union leaders, but look behind him. It seems that Mr. Spicer, after a heap of criticism at the weekend, was getting a vote of confidence from the councillor to the president. It's going to be a roller coaster ride. John Sopel, BBC News, Washington. Well, let's go live to the White House and John is there for us. John, let's talk about this range of executive orders that you were telling us about there. What they tell us really about the Trump style of government in these early days? Well, I think they give us a very clear indication of the direction of travel, what he wants to achieve. And these are the things that he set out during the presidential campaign. But I think they shouldn't be mistaken for sort of tablets of stone, if you like. So he announced Obamacare on Friday night. Well, people, re if you read the papers, you think it's already been abolished. It hasn't. They haven't worked out what they're going to replace it with. This is a statement of intent. And if you look at the, the trade deal with Canada and Mexico, NAFTA, to change that, it requires congressional approval. There are a lot of free trade supporters in the Republican Party in Congress who'll be very wary about changing it. And so they won't want to go too fast. So Donald Trump hasn't delivered massive change yet. It's very important as a statement, as a kind of down payment, if you like, on what the policy is going to be. But the big changes that he is promising have not been delivered yet. John, again, thanks very much. John Sobel there with the latest uh, at the White House. Well, Theresa May has uh, again refused to say whether or not an unarmed Trident missile veered off course during a test last year. The Defence Secretary, Sir Michael Fallon, told MPs that the system was successfully tested last June, but he would not provide any other details for reasons of national security. Labour MPs have accused ministers of a cover-up, and they say the Prime Minister should clarify how much she knew when she urged MPs to renew the Trident system in a vote last year. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, has the latest. Set condition 1SQ for weapon system readiness test. Aye, aye, sir. Pressing the nuclear button. Action stations. A process that's practised and practised, the hope it never happens for real. Weapon system in condition 1SQ for... WS but just before Theresa May took charge, a test like this of a missile maintained in the US didn't go according to plan. Yesterday, Theresa May refused to say if she knew. Prime Minister, did you know? There are tests that take place all the time uh, mm. for our, uh, regularly for our nuclear deterrents. What we were talking about in that debate that took place okay, it's not was about I'm not going to get an answer to this. It matters because the trial appears to have gone wrong just weeks before her new government asked MPs to approve billions of pounds to keep the weapons. We're launching this strategy here. Having failed to answer yesterday, today on a cabinet visit, the Prime Minister had to admit she did know. I'm regularly briefed on national security issues. I was briefed on the successful certification of HMS Vengeance and her crew. We don't comment on the operational details for national security reasons. This spectacular misfire in the late 80s of an American Trident missile is rare. The vast majority of tests have been successful. Order! Urgent question. And it's not clear what went wrong with this weapons trial. But Labour has found a lot wrong with the government's handling of the facts. At the heart of this issue is a worrying lack of transparency. And a Prime Minister who has chosen to cover up a serious incident rather than coming clean with the British public. This House, and more importantly, the British public, deserve better. The details of the uh, demonstration and shakedown operation I am not going to discuss publicly on the floor of this House. We simply want to know 
Was this test successful or not? Should we believe the White House official, who, while we've been sitting here debating, has confirmed to CNN that the missile did uh, auto self destruct off the coast of Florida? Once stories get out there that a missile may have failed, isn't it better to be quite frank about it? There are always some things that government wants to keep from MPs and the rest of us. But this time, Theresa May's hope of staying quiet seems to have backfired. The most straightforward questions, like who knew what, can be the trickiest of all. The political arguments over whether we need nuclear weapons are controversial enough. A fight over whether they work is a battle ministers would rather not have. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Let's go live to the Ministry of Defence this evening and our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale is there. Uh, Jonathan, do we have a better idea tonight of what exactly happened in this test? Well, Sir Michael Fallon, Defence Secretary, is still sticking to that script, refusing to confirm or deny for that matter whether something did go wrong with that test last June, citing operational national security reasons. The problem with that is that the Ministry of Defence in the past has publicised successful test launches. So why not this time? Was it because it was an inconvenient fact ahead of that Commons vote on renewing the Trident system? I think the bigger problem tonight is that while Michael Fallon essentially was stonewalling MPs in the Commons, over on the other side of the Atlantic, an unnamed US defence official was telling uh, Pentagon reporters that something did indeed go wrong with that test and that the test was aborted, the missile destroyed, mid-flight. Now, it's important to say that the Americans would know. They are the ones who build, who maintain and then lease these missiles to the UK. They would have that test data. They would know if something went wrong. So we're in this bizarre position tonight, whereas we've got the UK government saying that they will not comment further on what is Britain's independent nuclear deterrent. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Americans appear to be confirming that something went wrong. Jonathan, again, thanks very much uh, for the uh, latest there from the Minister of Defence. Jonathan Beale. An investigation into the death of an inmate at Chelmsford Prison has found a series of failures contributed to his suicide. Dean Saunders, who was 25, killed himself last January. The investigation found he should have been in hospital rather than in prison and that staff had ignored significant risk factors. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, has the story. Dean Saunders had no previous history of mental illness, but in December 2015, the young dad suddenly became paranoid and delusional, convinced he had to kill himself. The hand with the knife was free, and, and this time he'd come down to actually put it in his... to put it in his heart. Mark, okay. Dean's father, put his life on the line. On their kitchen floor, he struggled to get the knife from his son. He was stabbed several times. At one point, he held the knife in his own stomach. At that time, I thought, I can't let him have this knife. And I put my hand over the top of his, so he couldn't pull it out. Um, he tried to put, as he pulled it out, I held it in. I, I, I could not let him have that knife. Dean was charged with attempted murder and remanded in custody at Chelmsford Prison, initially on constant watch. But within days, a crucial meeting took place. Three members of staff, none of whom were medically trained, none of whom had read Dean's notes, decided to reduce his observations from constant watch to every half hour. His family pleaded with the prison not to do it. They were ignored. Last January, Dean did kill himself. Today's report found numerous problems in his care, including a failure to properly appreciate his risk of suicide. Can't handle knowing that he died on his own, away from family that was so important to him. And they'd done nothing at all, nothing. The private company providing health care in Chelmsford Prison have been criticised following suicides at other jails too. Care UK say they'll end their contract in Chelmsford early as they can't meet prisoners' needs with current resources. At least 113 prisoners killed themselves in England and Wales in 2016 a record number. There is a proliferation of official reports, reviews, inquest findings that all point to the crisis in our prisons, in particular the way in which people with mental ill health are treated. 
Ministers say they're investing millions to make prisons safer, but for Dean's family, it's all too late. We openly talk about Dean to Teddy. We talk, say, Daddy this, Daddy that. I kind of promise Dean there will never be a day that will pass that Teddy won't know how much you love him. From the incident, what happened in our kitchen, that's when they took him away. The next time I saw him was in the mortuary. I didn't get to tell him I loved him. I didn't get to tell him that I understand my injuries well because he was ill and I understood. I, I never got that chance. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, Essex. Negotiations aimed at ending the conflict in Syria are underway in Kazakhstan. It's the first time the talks have been convened by Russia, Turkey and Iran, rather than by the United Nations. It's also the first time that representatives of Syria's armed rebel groups have led the opposition side at the negotiating table. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Dusset, is in the capital, Astana. And Lise, can you report any progress on this first day? Well, Hugh, it's not surprising that after nearly six years of a brutal war, that the warring sides are here trading angry accusations. But something new is unfolding now. For the very first time in the past six years, you had rebel fighters and Syrian generals sitting at the same table in public, and they didn't walk out. And they agreed that the biggest priority now is to cement a shaky ceasefire across Syria. And what's even more crucial is what's been happening on the battlefield. In the past year, Russia has emerged as the most important military player, and it has turned the tide of the war in President Assad's favour, and then teamed up with Turkey, a main rebel backer, to try to bring this war to an end. It doesn't mean it's going to be any easier. The toughest problems of all still have to be sorted. Most of all, the role of President Assad in any future political transition. But step by step, they are beginning to wrestle with some of the outstanding issues of this conflict. So maybe there is a hope that Syria can at least start moving away from war, but it will still take a long time before it is actually on the brink of peace. Most of all, because there are many of the military players and the groups who are determined to continue the fight, and they include so-called Islamic State. Least, thank you for bringing us up to date there. Least to set the first day of those talks in Astana. The inquest into the deaths of 30 British people shot dead in Tunisia two years ago has started hearing evidence from survivors of the attack. One tourist described how he saw the gunman, Saif Adin Rezgui, uh, shoot a man who was lying on a sun lounger. Our correspondent, Daniela Relf, has this report. The shocking details of their death. Today, the court began to hear about each individual killed. John and Janet Stocker from South London were amongst the first people to be shot dead. Their family was in court as the couple were described as having died together doing what they enjoyed most, being side by side. Trudy Jones from South Wales was also killed on the beach. She was described as someone who put everyone's happiness before her own. The court was shown a map which illustrated the position of the sun loungers. Trudy Jones was sunbathing on the front row. John Stocker had been alongside her. Next to him was his wife, Janet. They were the gunman's first targets as he murdered tourist after tourist. This image shows the killer, Sephardine Rizgi, on the beach and people fleeing from here in fear when they realised what was happening. The court also saw this 3D animation of the resort. The blue skies, the sand and the pictures of those murdered each person shown where they were shot. One eyewitness account summed up the horror of that day. Simon Greaves described the gunman to the court. He said, I could see the male stood over someone. He fired a single shot. It was like an execution. The question of tourist safety is a recurrent one here. Today, an eyewitness said that the police response during the attack was poor, as was security generally around the hotel. Today was about just three victims, but there are many more harrowing stories to be told. Daniel Arelf, BBC News, at the High Court. 
Bernie Eccleston is no longer in charge of Formula One after the American company Liberty Media completed its takeover today. The 86-year-old has been F1's uh, chief executive for 40 years, but the new owners have replaced him with the American Chase Carey. Mr Eccleston has been given a role as chairman emeritus. He said he's proud of the business that he built. The Prime Minister presided over a cabinet meeting today in the northwest of England near Warrington and announced her industrial strategy for Britain after Brexit. Theresa May set out the details of how ministers will take a more interventionist approach by creating new technology colleges, extending specialist math schools and spending £170 million on creating new institutes of technology. Our business editor Simon Jack has more details. Growing an economy for the 21st century. This biotech firm is trying to increase crop yields, reduce fertiliser use and provide high-paying jobs. Most Conservative governments have preferred a hands-off approach to business, not this government. What this is about is creating the right conditions for the future economy for the UK. As we leave the European Union, I'm ambitious for the opportunities that are available to us building the truly global Britain. But we need to ensure that our economy is working for everyone, it's working in every part of the country. The government's 10-point plan includes investment in research and development in high-growth sectors, £170 million for technical colleges to improve skills and infrastructure investment targeted to fit regional needs. I think it's absolutely essential and it's been too long in coming. And it's all about coordination and directed and focused input to meet the needs of the economy of this country. And why wouldn't we be doing it if it's going to bring us the skills we need in a coordinated way with the key industry sectors that have the most potential for growth based on our scientific capability. The government wants businesses of the future, like biotechnology or life science, to grow. But with limited amounts of new money available, the fear is, is that while some sectors will be cultivated, others may wither, leaving behind the workers in those industries. Well, I don't think we can afford to leave any sector behind in an industrial strategy, uh, particularly given so many millions of workers uh, are employed in areas like retail, food, care, uh, where wages are often too low and investment too scarce. So it has to be uh, a holistic industrial policy for the whole country. After the government stepped in, Leyland decided... Previous to attempts to get involved in industrial strategy have met with some abject failures. Millions were poured into British Leyland, for example, to no avail. A strategy that somewhat ironically became known as picking winners. Modern industry leaders say this is different. Picking winners is much more about picking the company or the final product. What I think you're seeing here is a much, much earlier in the cascade of economic growth. This is all about building skills, it's about building capabilities, it's about building base technologies. These are just proposals at this stage, but ones the government hopes will inject new life into a post-Brexit economy. Simon Jack, BBC News, Nottingham. Doctors in Sheffield are pioneering the use of a small MRI brain scanner designed for use on premature babies. There are only two of these scanners in the world. And doctors say the equipment produces images which are far more detailed than the usual ultrasound scan. Our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh sent this exclusive report from Sheffield. Isaac was severely premature and needs a scan to check the swelling on his brain. Ultrasound like this is how all premature babies are scanned, but it doesn't always reveal what's gone wrong. Another premature baby, Alice Rose, born at 24 weeks, is on her way to have an MRI scan. Newborns are usually too fragile to be moved, but at the Royal Hallamshire, the purpose-built baby MRI is just meters from the special care unit. The white bits on that section, you can see, a little bit wider than they should be. The MRI confirms two bleeds on her brain, but crucially shows no further damage. For her parents, it's comforting news. I think it's a lot easier to understand with this kind of scan as opposed to the ultrasound that she had before. It's a lot crisper visual images. It is reassuring that you get a better look at it, makes you feel better. Lower down in the brain, for example, it's very difficult to make out uh, these structures low down, whereas on the MR examination, we see the brainstem and the cerebellum 
These two images prove the point. On the left is an ultrasound scan of Alice Rose's brain. On the right, an MRI scan. It's much more detailed and gives doctors more diagnostic information. All parts of the brain and the surrounding structures can be viewed very clearly, which is sometimes not the case in ultrasound. And also the, um, the, the range of brain abnormalities that can result from hemorrhage or uh, lack of blood supply to the brain are much more clearly shown. There are only two of these machines in the world. The other is in Boston in the United States. They are still experimental prototypes, not yet cleared for routine clinical use, but could represent the future for imaging newborns. Two months after she was born, Alice Rose still weighs less than three pounds. She's not out of the woods yet, but the MRI scan has given her parents hope that for their tiny baby daughter, things are beginning to look a little brighter. Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Sheffield. Martin McGuinness's successor as leader of Sinn Féin at the Stormont Assembly is Michelle O'Neill, and she'll take the party into an election for the Assembly in early March, an election in effect forced by the resignation of Martin McGuinness, which happened a fortnight ago. Uh, fog has led to high air pollution levels in some parts of the UK today. Uh, it caused flight cancellations and delays with pockets of high pollution, especially in the southeast of England and some urban areas of the Midlands and indeed in parts of Northern Ireland. Now this coming Friday, Holocaust Memorial Day, will see the general British release of the film Denial. It tells the story of a court case in the year 2000 involving an American author who had accused a British historian of being a Holocaust denier. The film, which premiered tonight in London, is being released at a time when the Jewish community in Britain is reporting a rise in the number of anti-Semitic incidents. Our religious affairs correspondent Martin Bashir considers the debate around the film. His report does contain some offensive images. Professor Lipstadt, I am that David Irving about whom you have been so rude. Yes, yes, I am Based on a libel action brought by the writer David Irving against the Jewish scholar Deborah Lipstadt, Denial charts her study of the Auschwitz death camp. Uh, this building was used to delouse the prisoners' clothing. I hope that people will see this film as speaking to a far larger issue than just the Holocaust. None of us thought of this when we, when we really started making the film exactly a year ago. Uh, that it would have such contemporary resonance. That resonance has been felt with increasing anti-Semitic vandalism, including this graffiti on a poster for the film. It's a very disturbing phenomenon. It's people who, who, were, who always felt or believed or feared that their racist thoughts and anti-Semitic thoughts couldn't be expressed, now feeling they have carte blanche. This rabbi from London's small Haredi community says Holocaust denial plays a significant part in rising levels of anti-Semitism. There's been a steep change in attitudes. Whilst 10, 15 years ago, even if someone had these feelings, they would be no shame to express them. What's caused that change? I think that we are 70 years from the Holocaust. Now, sadly, a lot of people are forgetting what these type of attitudes can bring to. It's thought 2016 could be the worst year on record for anti-Semitism in Britain when figures are published next month by the organization that records incidents. From across the country, we're receiving about 100 incident reports every single month. That's from members of the public, and also from data exchanges with the police. So things are as bad as they've ever been. Denial ends with the judge finding in Lipstadt's favour that David Irving was an active Holocaust denier, anti-Semitic and racist. I hope this film will stop people and, and, and make them realise that there A, there's certain facts, facts that are undeniable. Something worth remembering in an era of post-truth politics. Martin Bashir, BBC News. The actor Gordon Kay, who starred in the long-running BBC sitcom Alo Alo, has died at the age of 75. 
Would you believe it possible that the plot has now thickened? He appeared in all 82 episodes of the show, playing René, the owner of a cafe in Nazi-occupied France. His career also included appearances in Coronation Street, Citizen Smith and It Ain't Half Hot Mum. Tributes all day to the actor Gordon Kay, who's died at the age of 75. Now, the double Olympic boxing champion Nicola Adams has confirmed that she is turning professional. It means uh, it's unlikely that she'll be competing at the 2020 Games in Tokyo. She made the announcement at a news conference earlier today. Our sports correspondent Katie Gornell has been talking to her. There is uh, some flash photography coming up. I'm here eating humble pie today. There was a time when promoter Frank Warren wasn't interested in women's boxing, but Nicola Adams changed his mind. This is a fighter used to breaking new ground. Last year in Rio, she became the first Briton to successfully defend an Olympic boxing title in nearly 100 years. She's also the reigning world, European and Commonwealth champion. As an amateur, she told me she has nothing left to prove. There's not a lot of goals in the professional ranks to, to achieve, becoming a world world champion and a European champion. There's, there's, so many, there's so many goals to achieve in the professional ranks, raising the game um, again and, um, and, and just making are hopefully trying to make um, women's boxing on par with the, with the men's. Adams is one of a number of Olympic champions to have turned professional in the last few months. The Irish star Katie Taylor recently featured on the undercard of Anthony Joshua's high-profile title fight. And it's hoped that boxing could follow the lead of mixed martial arts, where female fighters regularly top the bill. This is a different time, different era, you know, and uh, I, I think that you know, the standard has improved, that's why I, I, I actually want to get involved in it, because it is a better standard. And I think that for us, uh, you know, she will prove that. Adams will have to wait until April to make her debut in Manchester before a fight in her home city of Leeds in May. So far, she's done everything asked of her. Now it's time to see if she can live up to her billing once again. Katie Gornall, BBC News in London. Nicola Adams there sharing her plans with uh, Katie Gornall. That's all from us here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.